I'm in the recording right now. So Anup sent us this MCQ, uh, which were uh, I'm starting the class with. Uh, the question is the diagram shows the market thermometer that is the tube is open to the atmosphere. The left hand side of, is connected to a container containing a glass at pressure P. So we have some gas tapped in here, and here this side is open. Atmospheric pressure on its own can support a column of mercury of height 756 millimeter. Which height of column does pressure P on its own support? So the question is basically. What is the pressure inside this bulb in terms of height of mercury? Now you have to understand one thing. For the case of pressure expressed in terms of uh, liquid height, mercury or water, we always consider vertical height. The inclined height or curved height, I mean this part could as well be like a, uh, like a spiral. It could be like a curved left and right. It could have any shape. These curved or non-vertical distances are never relevant in the formula p equals to h o g that h represents vertical height always always so you have to understand that this 80 millimeter is practically given over here to confuse you the appropriate length of mercury that is relevant for this whole discussion is the 60 millimeter height of mercury and now you have to see that in this case the atmospheric pressure is below and the gas pressure is above which means this is a low pressure, this is a high pressure. Atmosphere is applying a bigger pressure on this surface compared to the pressure exerted by the gas on this surface. So now atmospheric pressure is large, gas pressure is small. How much small? 60 millimeter of mercury is small. So the question already given us that atmospheric pressure on its own can support supports a column of mercury of height 756 millimeter. This is the mercury column that atmosphere can hold on its own. So the gas pressure over here will be able to support 60 millimeter less of that. 60 millimeter less of that. So you subtract from 60 meter from here. So how much do you get? Uh, 696. So, 696. So the core pressure or the default pressure of this whole thing would be 696 millimeter of mercury. I believe B is the correct response. Is this B the correct response? Sir, how do you find uh, yes, sir. Consent. Sir, how yes, sir. Consent. 60 millimeter bombs. So I guess B correct. Hey, B is the correct answer. But whatever the people do, correct form. If you have an extra answer and if you can check the answer, you can. And if you do something different, let me know about this. Hey, Bolo, keep all the silly. I just go, I just go, Bolo, so that I can respond individually. Sir, how did you found the answer? I, I could not understand, sir. Okay, so going to the explanation one more time. This is the inclined height, not relevant. Vertical height, relevant. This is the lower level, high pressure. This is the higher level, low pressure. The pressure at this level, atmospheric pressure, by default, is given over here. Atmosphere on its own can hold a mercury column of 756 millimeter, which means Atmospheric pressure, if you use it as a barometer, is gonna give us a mercury column of 756 millimeter, which is not a part of this figure. But atmospheric pressure on its own can hold a vertical column of 756 millimeter. The question is how much vertical height of a mercury column can this pressure hold? So you can see from this figure that the pressure inside this, uh, what can I say, container this uh, sphere, the patient said this sphere, hollow sphere, is 60 millimeter of mercury less than the atmospheric pressure because the vertical height is what matters. So we have to subtract from the atmospheric pressure a 60 millimeter value because this pressure is lower because this is a higher level, this is a lower level. So I practically just subtracted from 756, 60, which gives me 696 millimeter. So that Pressure of the sphere of the gas inside the sphere is 696 millimeter of mercury. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, wow, what? Wow. I can eh?
আচ্ছা লেট মি আস্ক ইউ কিস দিস क्वेश्चन হাউ উড ইউ এক্সপেক্ট দা রিভিশন ক্লাস টু গো বাই উড ইউ এক্সপেক্ট ইট টু গো বাই বুলেট হেডিংস অফ দিস টেবল ডাজ দ্যাট হেল্প বি হেল্প বেটার অর আই উড জাস্ট আই এম জাস্ট গোনা গিভ ইউ দা বেসিক লেকচার দ্যাট আই গো ফর ইন ক্লাস 9 স্যার হোয়াট ইজ দ্য ডিফারেন্স স্যার হোয়াট ইজ দ্য The difference is if we go by this list, we will have a very tight understanding that we have covered every defined corner of the syllabus, and also you would know what are the stuff, what are the what are the exclusive topics that you do require help about, and what are the stuffs that you do not require help about, and we can only cover the stuffs more in more detail the, for the parts that you do require help about. If you go by the list, if you don't go by the list, then I'll be generally skimming over the topics that is in the syllabus as, as far as my lecture goes, and I'll be giving a general discussion. for what is uh, how the typical classes go by which is the basic lecture for all the lectures of those chapters uh, the lectures are going to be pretty much identical in terms of content and explanation only that we are not going to be discussing the worksheet problems that's the only thing that we are not going to have vice versa if you want to have the very general classes you can always look up the youtube lecture for which is available for the class 9 people where the lectures are really wide and vivid and detailed uh, you just have to make time for it so me telling you and the uh, youtube video telling you is practically the same thing because you can always ask me questions regarding the uh, videos so if you just go into the class 9 worksheet a class 9 uh, 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 volume so we have the graph discussion over here the graphs continue graphs for the continue we have air resistance then parachute is a graph so we have these things covered in a very wide vivid level of details for the force acceleration motion so which actually uh, happened up to here this is the part where the discussion for the force acceleration motion chapter finished which is actually pretty long But, sir that's the problem you... we can't make time our some mock examples already started sir syllabus er point by point jai sir eta mone bhalo hobe but still with some worksheet problem sir karon sir worksheet gulo na kole sir eto par abar patches lage sir yeah yeah that's totally understandable um option one better I personally prefer to go the revision class for the revision checklist. I personally like this better. There are certain. Uh, this is actually the defined uh, segmentation of the whole syllabus. Uh, whole, whole syllabus. So uh, this is basically the solid boundary of the syllabus. But there are some shady regions also the solid boundary which I call the dotted boundary. Uh, in places, I'll be picking up those dotted boundaries for relevant topics as we'll go by. So I'll be going by this list. Uh, if you have something else outside this list that you would like me to discuss, for example, a very specific worksheet question, for a specific year question, for a specific test question from other teachers, if you have already started mocks over there, I really don't mind. Any type of physics problem that can help you get better at physics exams, understanding and better 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 understanding physics, pop them in the revision classes. The revision class is open for all sorts of resources from all sorts of sources. so there is no prejudice here there is no holding back you can put put up any question doesn't matter that's one thing and i'm going to go by this list so and for yusuf uh, i just told you that if you would like me to discuss some specific problems from the worksheet i'm not going to go by uh, general rigorous question number 1 question number 2 question number 3 not like that if you want me to discuss some specific problem just send up those numbers either in the messenger chat or in when when you're doing the classes you can put up in the zoom chat window and we 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 will try to pick that up for a relevant topic bucho sir do you see discord anymore sir i only use discord in cases i am playing video games with my friends sir that's even sad uh well i don't do classes in discords anymore why why why, why do you ask that For a long time, sir. I mean, we started with Discord and then we abandoned it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Discord people needed to be smarter to accommodate a bigger number of people and longer classes and allow the video recording built-in options, which they didn't. This Discord was generally built up for a more general approach for basic video voice chatting, and that's basically what they did. It was not designed for a stream service. Twitch is designed for a stream service. Discord was not. 
uh, and Discord did not upgrade as when Zoom was uh, making their upgradation. So basically, Zoom take over the market, took over the market. Sir, you don't do classes on Twitch, do you? No. That I'm not more fun. But the no. problem is we couldn't talk with you. That's the serious yes. problem. So that's why it's not. Anyway, uh, disregarding the preference of softwares, <coughs> I'm getting into the list. So we have 30 people, four people. So 30 students, hopefully one with me. <coughs> Any one of you, kids, listen up. This is the part where you come with all of your questions. You have any question, you raise your hand, ask the question, at the end of the voice channel, if you're not comfortable with the voice channel, which you should be by now, you write it in the chat window. And if you're writing in the chat window, make sure the question is given for everyone. Do not write me personally, because in that case, I just have to repeat the whole question to the all other people because they're not gonna be seeing it. So, first thing, physical quantities and measurement, scalars and vectors, define the term scalar and vector. You know this definition. Scalar only has uh, magnitude, whereas vectors have magnitudes and duration both. Find the resultant of two vectors by a graphical method. We have two methods over here. One is the triangular method and the other one is the parallelogram method. And the key difference between these two methods is that, uh, Acha, bhalo kotha. Bhalo kotha. I should actually print quite a good number of copies of notes for the Indian mechanics as well. Oh, hold up. Let me show you something. Thank you, sir. So, I'm going to say, 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 I'm going the whole in internal mechanics. I don't have hard copy for the other topics, but I have other students' copies and some uh, typed material for the other topics. For those of you who do appreciate to have this for your revision material, you can have it. I can I can make make printouts for tomorrow for you to pick it up. Maybe later. Let's say thirty copies or so. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Okay, sir. Sir, I'm a decent senator. Sir, I'm Raja Leta, sir. Sir, 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 sir. You can do it. Stop that kinematic and dynamic. Sir, that's the soft copy that you can do. Sir, I'm going to do a question paper for Kono Vachi Dia Chilen. Okay, hold up. Act Jan Jan Korea. Sir, the soft copy that you group it together. Eight are soft copy size for the Halak Burger. It is size soft copy size is 239 megabytes. It is a good one. Message in Messenger chat only uh, only accommodate up to 25 MB. It is a share good to the Lamare Google Drive upload code link share good to the messed up job achievable, not impossible, but it will take time. Act number. Do number who say, Yeah, I don't know. Kiji Susila, sir. J P four dollar per artichoke. Dear children, to the last before I should the opera. I have on the account printer materials. Then I before was the last printer materials that you received from me. If I can want the account printer material, then I am asking you to start collecting some printer materials from tomorrow. I have the waves and the atomic fields ready for you. Uh, I have, I am, I have started to uh, print out the. Uh, magnetism now currently working with magnetism to mother kase physically available as a kiki to but to now kase physically task kora shomoy electricity put out of iso or who say yeah put out of iso yeah neutral magnetic put out of iso but if you still want to have this lecture i can make it available i can call jama let's say pinter of check that on the classes from pinter show go uh let's see how long it can take anyway jara later join kore chet other general revision shuru kore jim kim to it top that kinematic and dynamic some other general delay better Mujinai. To me, Sana should go to high volume, she should go to low volume. Maintain the same volume, please. I babolo. Mujinami, please. Amraja late joined Kurichi, other to revision class of Chilo, but it stopped because of COVID and kinematics and dynamics for Junto Puri. So, Amadajuno noted the level. Okay, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll have the note available for you. Whoever you send, or if you say if you come by yourself, you can have the note be picked up. Do we no, sir, is it Newtonian mechanics? Sir? No. Eight, 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 Newton mechanics note. This this is the Newtonian mechanics note. All the all, all the six topics are here. Aj, uh, Aj, all the six topics are here. Six chapters are here. This whole thing, fifty-four pages. So tell I can pick it up. I'm I'm hoping that I I can start discussing your notes from tomorrow. That's what I say. Sir, hello. It tapne to graph graphic picture jaise maine kya? Yahan ne note aamato question chule yahan ne. Acha graphic picture di tu pa jaise si graph je scalar vector tu ko bolenge tapan me graphic picture jaise si. Don't worry. Acha graphic picture yahan ne si. Acha hello hello hello. Sir sir. Ah. Ajo question. Ajo question. Munam bolenge shesh karo. Do one hatu thau. So that I can give you the floor and we can have some discipline. It actually helps. Yeah. How to do that? Sir, I'm. I'll give you. Munam, tell. Sir, I'm. I just want to put this in a magnum. Open it and let it put this in a key lesson. After that, y is equal to. This one. G G G. It is key. Oh, sir. It is what? Che graphs. Y is equal to. Y is equal. Like, I mean, verses. How? Like, I mean, the beta. How? The beta. Some of them take print out or something. How? To nine. How? Yes. I mean, the beta. Y versus x. Y versus X one also. Whenever we describe a graph, we always say some variable versus some variable. For example, force versus extension, pressure versus area, mass versus volume. This kind of variable. ठीक है सर. For Y versus yeah. X always means Y is on the Y axis and X is on the X axis. The first variable is always on the Y axis, and second one is the X axis variable. Try to hold your question. Go ahead. Go ahead. सर क्वेश्चन जो ग्राफ ग्राफ नंबर फोर टा सर ना गेडियन फोर टा वो जो इधर क्या ना डिक्रीज होती है एक तो बुस्ता वाले जो फोर टा सिलम Decreasing graph with increasing gradient. Both the same. The first word def defines that increasing and decreasing. The A word, this word is defined practically that how does the value of y changes as x value increases. So, eighth note, the the property of all three of this graph is that as x value is increasing, y value is also increasing. You have increasing value of y except for this part. This part is a bit wrong. This is supposed to be all increasing all through. So, th this is the part. I mean, With increasing value of x, you have bigger value of y. Simple. Your y value is not decreasing with the increase of x. x as x become bigger, y also becomes bigger. But how does that become bigger? Is it becoming bigger linearly or exponentially or or decreasing decreasingly? That depends on the gradient of the line. So these three are increasing graphs. These three are decreasing graphs. Decreasing graphs means how does y change with respect to x first, and then. How does that change happen? I mean, if it is increasing, how is it increasing? If it is decreasing for these three, how is it decreasing? That's the part. So, the, all of these three graphs are designed in such a way that as x value it goes higher from left to right, the y value slowly becomes less, less, less. So it starts with the high value of y, with the increase, with the with the right right right, right side movement of the x, x value, the y value slowly becomes less. So that's why they are called decreasing graphs. However, the gradient of the graph can be very uh, conveniently uh, considered by observing this thing, which is sometimes called the uh, stray figure. That you have to observe that how does the alignment of this gradient line or the tangent line uh, changes from left to right? Is it losing gradient or is it, it is is it getting is it becoming more vertical or is it becoming less vertical? That's what you have to observe. If it is becoming more vertical, then it is increasing gradient. If it is becoming less vertical, then it is decreasing gradient. Thank you, sir. Clear, who is it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ah, so beautiful. Oh, big. Sir, currently, uh, currently, electricity P two to our soft core. Apne ke submit kore chilo, sir. Can they return by me? Huh. Oita, our kaise aase? Oita, our kaise nam dia aase? So, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be happy to arrange in terms of your uh, roll numbers. Sir, actually, PDP is right now. Uh, I'll have it arranged in alphabetical order for all, all the worksheets. I I do have it. I have the bundle. I I I have it in 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 proper storage local location. Uh, whenever you send someone, you send with your name, so uh, the your worksheet will be found or sorted out from that bundle, and it will be returned back to you. Okay, sir. Okay. So exactly, this is the part where we have the vector diagrams. So we have the triangle rule over here. The component vectors are placed one after another. That is, from the end point of the first vector, we start the second vector. The result is the complete set of the triangle in opposite directions. 
So we have this thing uh, over in this direction. So let's say we have two vectors that we're trying to work with. One, this was a wrong diagram, so that's why I cut it off. Uh, I gave a C over here and these things flatten all. So uh, this is actually a correction. Uh, this is the second vector, which is supposed to be 10 Newton, uh, 18 Newton. So we have one vector of 100 Newton. We have another vector of 18 Newton working on an object. For example, if you want to find out the result using triangle vector, triangle rule, we have to place the vectors one after another, which means with appropriate scale and direction, we have to drop the first vector. From the ending point of this first vector, we have, to, we have to draw the second vector. So these two vectors would be in a single sequence. Single sequence means they will be continuously going in with one arrow direction. Then we can find out the resultant uh, by joining the line from the start point of the first vector to the end point of the second vector. And that arrow gives you the result. And that's the triangle rule. Vice versa, we can go for a parallelogram rule where we all in one second can have two different forces. Let's say over here we have 110, 18, 100 Newton and 80 Newton. And for the case of parallelogram rule, two component vectors are drawn to scale starting from the same point. That's the difference. Sorry. Uh, so the two component vectors are drawn to scale starting from the same point. The diagonal of the complicated parallelogram gives the resultant from the starting point. So in this case, both the component vectors, component vectors essentially mean the term component vector means that the part vectors, which we are trying to add up. For example, let's say if it is so that X equals to Y plus Z, then X is meant to be the resultant and Y and Z are supposed to be the component vectors. So component vectors means the things that we, you are provided with from which you are trying to get the resultant. So for the case of pair parallelogram rule, the component vectors are drawn from the same point and we complete the parallelogram. And initially the diagonal gives us the resultant in terms of uh, scale and the appropriate uh, direction as well. So a is the rule of basic difference. So the second bullet right over close. So it says that over here. The resultant vector means an overall vector. Can we say that? Or a vector in an overall direction. Overall, did you say overall? Yes, sir. Now, resultant vectors is not named by overall. So I would not appreciate that term. Uh, resultant vectors means it is the combined effect of both of those vectors. Combined effect. Uh, simple terms, if I may say that, let's say, if you try to push uh, one object with two different forces, the object is not going to individually move under the effect of both the forces. It's not going to have two, it's not going to have two different accelerations in two different directions. It is going to give you a single combined effect of both of the forces and give you a combined acceleration, uh, which is going to be the combined effect of both of these forces. Resultant means that combined effect. We don't use the term overall. The reason I'm uh, discouraging you to term, they use the term overall because that's not a common term that we use to mean what is resultant. Combined is a much better term rather than overall. Thank you, sir. Sure. So uh, that's that. And then we have this thing. Uh, this was the second bullet, find the resultant of two vectors by a graphical method. And then we have this, know which of the following are scalars and vectors and which are vectors, distance, displacement length, speed, velocity, time, acceleration, mass, and force. So you know these stuff, which is what? Uh, then comes the measurement techniques. Describe how to measure different lengths with suitable accuracy using tapes, rules, micrometers, and calipers. The use of a binary scale is not required. So this is the important part that in your MCQ paper, you will not be asked question about the being able to read off the uh, value from a, from a binary calipers. Uh, you will not be asked that. But micrometer screw gauge is not discarded, which means micrometer screw gauge readings can throw up. Weird, but that's how the syllabus pans out. So important for you to understand is that which measuring equipment should we use in a, for the measurement of a certain uh, certain length or certain quantity is highly dependent on how small or how big that is. There are two things which play a key factor. One thing is that we want to measure our thing, our quantity with an acceptable, acceptable value of precision. Acceptable value of precision essentially means that we would not want our value to be redundantly large and we do not want to be redundantly small. What does that mean? For example, let's say 
uh, if you are trying to measure the distance from the sun to earth, the radius of earth is not anything compared to that distance. So if you measure the distance from sun to earth, from the uh, sun center to the earth surface or from the sun center to the earth center, you are practically going to end up with the same number. You might have some difference at the, let's say, six, seven, eight digit uh, for, uh, on the right side. So that variation might not matter much. So in this case, the radius of the earth is negligibly small. So that's important. But if you ask, if you think that, well, does that mean that earth doesn't have any radius? Well, that's not true. Earth has a very large radius. But for that comparison, that measurement is uh, unnecessary. The precision is unnecessary. That's point one. Point two, if you're trying to measure uh, some very small stuff, for example, let's say, um, what can I say? Yeah, if you're trying to measure the diameter of a metal wire, think about it. If you're trying to measure the diameter of a metal wire, diameter of metal wire is actually very small because whenever I use the term wire, it is basically a thin cylinder. It's basically a thin cylinder, but it is possible that the diameter of a thin cylinder by manufacturing process or by, or by usage, it might, might not be same everywhere. And we have to even accommodate for that measurement as well. So that's why we, we recommend that we take the measurement of the, the diameter of the wire in multiple places along the length of the wire. And then we average those factors so that we can average out those mores and less so that we can get a more uniform value for so that we can consider the whole thing as a single of a single diameter. So if you're trying to measure small measurements, you have to understand how much small are we going for. This, I mean, in terms, of, in terms of small measurements, I mean, the scale goes like this, that very small things we prefer to measure with micrometer screw gauge, a bit more bigger, or pretty much from the, within the same scale, we can use vernier calipers. Then we have meter rule, because meter rules have a small fraction of one millimeter. Then we can have, beyond meter rule, we can have measuring tape. Measuring tape and trundle wheel, they can both be used alternately in places. Important part is that, uh, it's very important for your kids to understand that, in the like, meter rule is a rule of straight length. For example, the way you see meter rules printed on uh, wooden wooden rulers, which means using a meter rule, you can measure a linear distance very accurately, but you cannot essentially measure curved distance. For example, if you're trying to measure the uh, perimeter of a drum, drum, if you want to be trying to measure the perimeter of a drum, using a meter rule is not a very good idea, directly. Uh, using a measuring tape would be a much better idea. But let's say if you do not have uh, a, me a measuring tape, thank you. If you do not have a measuring tape available to you, and you still want to, uh, you only have a meter rule available to you, and you still have to use that to measure the perimeter of a drum, one good idea is that choose something else which can rotate around that drum. For example, you can choose a piece of rope which is long enough and wrap it around the drum multiple times and keep the loops very close to each other so that there's not, no, not much uh, give between the loops. And then you can measure the total length of the rope once you unwind it from this thing in a linear me measure that, uh, that let's say two times take this much distance. So one perimeter would be divided, that whole length divided two. So you can use a carved object to measure, to get a measurement of how, how much, how big is that for multiple turns. And then you can take it away from the object measurement to be measured object. And eventually you can use a meter rule to measure how big is that in a linear condition. It's not very practical to use a meter rule to roll over onto, uh, onto a, a carved surface because it's not essentially unachievable, but it's not recommended because uh, we can have sleep problems, we can have parallax error, uh, which we do not essentially want to have. So choice of the uh, equipment is pretty important. Then again, if you are trying to think about that, how can we measure uh, certain distances which are pretty large, for example, measuring the length of a football field, we can use meter rule, but in this case, using a measuring tape would be a much better choice because a measuring tape, you can measure a really large amount of length with a single single uh, measurement or a single stroke or a single attempt because it's pretty long. Uh, or alternatively, you can also use a trundle wheel. A trundle wheel is basically a, a very uh, measuredly designed wheel, which has a fixed circumference of about one meter. Uh, not about one meter, it has a fixed, and typically it has a fixed circumference of exactly one meter and we place it on the ground and then as we walk by by rolling it on the ground every single rotation of the wheel represents that we have covered is it one meter distance so that can be also used to measure the thing to be honest it is the uh, the way uh, the way typical cars not modern cars because modern cars take help for the gps uh, to show their uh, speed 
but when GPS was not available or not that much widespreadly used, uh, the way moving vehicles uh, actually showed us the speed of the vehicle was by measuring the rate of turn of the wheel. So let's say you have a very old mechanical car which doesn't have the GPS and everything and you have a speed speedometer in, in front of the dial, in front of the, the steering wheel. The way this steering wheel would, uh, the, this speedometer would give you this uh, speed that it would have some pre-entered value in, in the, in the uh, uh, device mechanism that how big is the circumference of the wheel. And then with one single circle, roll of the wheel is gonna cover one circumference worth of distance. So it's gonna count basically how many rotations it is making every second and then convert and then it's gonna convert that into the distance and with appropriate scale values is gonna show us that dial value in the appropriate kilometers per hour or miles per hour depending upon whether it's uh, uh, rest of the world or America it can happen. So, so it just shows up. Hold up, hold up, hold up, Salman, yeah. uh, Salman, wait, hold up, Yusuf, Yusuf, hold up. Uh, I, I, I'll go to a certain point then uh, if, it's better if you raise your hands that makes the whole discussion a bit more easier for us everyone to get part. Uh, how to I, I, I'll, I'll ask you to ask the question. Just give me a bit of time. So it has checked apart. So the reason I'm so the reason I'm telling you all this stuff is that you have to have a good understanding that what is the appropriate instrument to measure a certain thing. It is not practical to use a vernier calipers to try attempt to measure the uh, length of a room. That's just unwise. Uh, but if you wonder, is it impossible? The answer is no. Is it required? It's no. So if you are trying to measure some big lengths, bigger instruments are, are preferred. If you're trying to measure some very small lengths, precise instruments are preferred. So that's that. And I cannot think of anything else that comes from my head. So I'll take questions. Yeah, Ovik, you raise your hand first. Sir, uh, resultant force and direction to when they explain core to to Buzabin. Resonant force, uh, resonant vector direction, uh, mention correction. No, another uh, we can mention it in two different ways. Uh, if you if you go for the figure, let's say. So. Let's say you have drawn up this figure with appropriate scale and everything. So you have two given directions. One is this one, another one is this one. Uh, the reason they have, uh, the student have written 10 and eight to show you an appropriate, appropriate uh, an acceptable ratio uh, of the diagram. So it might as well be 10, 10 centimeter, eight centimeter, 10 millimeter, eight millimeter, 10 miles, eight miles, depending upon where you are trying to get that first, first diagram. The way we can represent the direction of the resultant is with respect to any of the component vectors with respect to any of the component vectors. That's the first thing you want to get in your head, which means you can either measure this angle and say the resultant produces this much angle with 100 Newton force, done. Or you could measure this much angle and you could say the resultant produces this much angle with the 80 Newton force, done. You have to choose one of the component forces or one of the component vectors and measure the angle of the resultant with that direction. This is the first thing. This is a rule of thumb. This is the primary thing that the, how it goes, goes by. In many cases, one of these forces can be horizontal or maybe one of the forces can be vertical. So in those cases, other than mentioning that it, the resultant produces this much angle with that force or with, we can also say, let's say in this case, other than saying that uh, uh, this resultant produces this much angle with 100 Newton. I could also say the resultant produces this much angle with the horizontal. That will also do because for this figure, the 100 Newton force is attempted to be drawn to be horizontal. So if one of the component vectors happen to be in the horizontal alignment or in the vertical alignment, you can replace the name of that component force with the horizontal or the vertical word. That also works. That's it. Mucho. Sir. Uh... I mean, 
স্যার আমি আমি ওটা একটু খুঁজে বের করে আপনাকে দিচ্ছি স্যার আচ্ছা এখানে খুঁজে বের করতে পারো ইফ ইফ দ্যাটস আই ইউ নো হোয়াট এভার দ্যাট ইজ আই ক্যান শেয়ার ইন आवर চ্যানেল আই টেক এ পিকচার অর ইফ ইউ ইউ ক্যান সেন্ড ইট লেটার অ্যাজ ওয়েল সো দ্যাট ইউ ক্যান পিক ইট আপ অন দ্য নেক্সট ক্লাস ইওর চয়েস ইয়েস সো আই টেক অ্যানাদার কোশ্চেন সালমান স্যার মানে আমি ইনিশিয়ালি যেটা বুঝিনি হচ্ছে যে স্যার আপনি যে কারের एग्जांपल দিয়ে দিয়েছেন স্যার আপনি বলছেন একটা রেপ পাস হয় তারপরে তারপরে স্যার আমি কিছু বুঝতে পারছিলাম না রেপ পাস হয় নো নো আই ডিডন্ট সে রেপ পাস হয় মানে এটা কি বললেন না আমি এটা বুঝি নাই স্যার দা কারস মেকানিজম নোস এক্স্যাক্টলি হাউ মাচ ইজ দা সারকামফারেন্স অফ ওয়ান হুইল এন্ড থ্রু সাম মেকানিজম through some counting mechanism it counts exactly how many times does it rotate as the car moves forward the number of rotation of the wheel is converted into distance covered and with respect to time that distance covered is shown in the dial as speed so in this case the linear distance covered by the car is very much relevant to the circumference of the tire বুঝছো কি না না বুঝতে বল আই হেল্প ইউ বি আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড বেটার আরটো বলবো স্যার মেকানিজমটা জানি না বাট মানে আমরা হচ্ছে স্যার মেকানিজমটা জানি না বাট ইট নোস ইয়া ইট হ্যাজ ইট অ্যাকচুয়ালি নোস মিন্স ইট উই অ্যাকচুয়ালি ফিড দা ভ্যালু দ্যাট হোয়াট ইজ দা অ্যাপ্রক্সিমেট সারকামফারেন্স অফ এ অফ এ প্রপারলি ইনফ্লেটেড হুইল সো ইফ দা হুইল রোটেটস ওয়ান ফুল রেভলুশন হাউ ফার দা কার উড হ্যাভ মুভ ियसलीजे without the use of this angle we are not going to able to draw this vector diagram because you have to okay. draw the draw the component vectors with appropriate angle between them so triangle rule lo ki same sir ha triangle rule jono same but triangle rule jono angle ta baire dike hoy baire dike hoy sir dekho here the two component forces were 100 newton and 80 newton this was the angle between them as 70 degree so this was an acute angle so here i have to place The eighty newton at the end point of the hundred eighty hundred newton. So if I draw an acute angle on the left side, this would be losing its direction. That's not going to work out. I have to keep the eighty newton upward right as it is given over here upward right. That's why the seventy newton is coming on the outside of the triangle, not on the inside. Yes, sir. So how do you know that it will come in the inside or outside? I mean, will it always come? Uh, the angle will always be given from of the outside angle. you will you will come to understand this from your experience of geometry and uh, practice but one bottom line that i can tell you uh, which can help you in the long run is that the in the diagram in the in the actual vector diagram for example in this case this one in the actual vector diagram the alignment of the component vectors should be exactly same as the given scenario so if this force is horizontally to the right in your vector diagram this should also be horizontally to the right if this is force is working upward right in the vector diagram this should also be upward right you should not have that basic direction reverted which would, which is going to cause us some trouble or in other words i can say that this this arrow arrow heads that is given in your actual figure these should be par parallel with the actual representing force on this figure so, so let's say 100 newton horizontal 100 newton horizontal 80 newton over here 80 newton over here so this line should be parallel with this one approximately uh, this line should be parallel to this one line approximately that's basically ensures that we are keeping the di direction same for each other yes sir you check sir yes sir very good so ovi gave us something let's save it on the desktop okay i did some save something on the desktop why is it my desktop is a mess sir a top left oh, number three ta oops thank you thank you All right. So what we have over here is this that we have this thing.
this is the force of the tow 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 towing trucks tow trucks uh so they have to see that uh correct uh, bus er chilo oh acha bolche na this is uh i i i'm asking which which question is this because uh so that i can actually bring everyone on the same ground so that it's easier for us to understand the question and knowing the question helps to understand the uh, problem better so i'm question as well get the high this just give me a bit of a time sir do you need the question sir by seeing just by just simply seeing the answer bujhe nahi sir apni matra answer ta dekhe question ta bujhe felen kotha theke asche I've been teaching teaching these questions for ten years, kid. <laughs> There it is. That's it. All right. <clears throat> so let's have a look at this question so that we can understand this better. So this question says that a bus breaks down on the road at a ten degree upward slope. Ten degree upward slope means that with the horizon of the slope is ten degree. That's the important bit. 10 degree upward slope so the horizontal horizontal is not shown in this figure but with the horizon if you do do a horizontal line over here uh then this angle is going to be 10 degree the passengers get out and push the bus to to the top of the slope at a constant speed why would the passengers do that these people are not even pushing the bus they're pushing the people <laughs> anyway i'm just trying to mess with you Uh, the passenger gets out as well. anyway uh fear number one shows the passenger is getting a force on the bus parallel to the line of the slope the total mass of the bus is 3200 kg calculate the weight of the bus we capture the two drawers to ratio of the total force size by the passenger of the bus is 7000 kg on the line of the slope use a graphical method to determine the size and the direction of the resultant of this force and the weight of the bus state the scale used so we have to give the scale size so and direction of the resultant. that's the big that's the question so what obik did is that he drew this figure So 36,000 newton force was represented by 6 cm arrowhead and 7,000 newton was represented by 3.4 cm arrowhead and he did draw a 10 degree over here i assume this angle is 10 degree right i can see i can see this dot over here which is suppose which i believe is the dot for the protector mark maybe i i i think it is uh and then uh this here is the resultant so this is a vertical line this is a, this is the uh, resultant force So the scale is one centimeter for five thousand newton. Good scale. So the result is thirty-four thousand newton. You can just measure it and eventually multiply it by five thousand. Here is the resultant. Bottom right of. Oh no 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 no! You didn't have to write bottom right of page. You could have just simply write. Sir, see the angle that I wrote it on. This is the seventy-one degree, right? This is yes, the seventy-one sir. degree. Okay, so you could have simply written the seventy-one degree downwards, right? I mean, you are asked to find out the resultant for the actual question, for the actual scenario. You are here mentioning the direction of the resultant for your figure. You have to understand that the figure is not the physical thing. What is the physical thing? the bus and the people the pushing scenario is a physical thing right yes sir so that's why you messed up that's why the examiner gave a cross on the page page mark because it's not supposed to be for the which is with the with reference for the page not to with respect with reference for the page it's supposed to be general 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 means that you could have written that the resultant is 71 degree downward right with the 70000 newton force this would be perfectly all right for example in this case it says that have a look uh, the mark scheme says mm. 58.5 degree dash 61.5 degree to horizontal no 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 This is just the this is just a reference for how much this angle is supposed to be with this thing. Kids, according to CA, kids are allowed to express the resultant angle with any of the component vectors or any of the. For example, if you have this much angle, you could very well get the angle with the vertical down, right? 
Yes, Just update this just for 90 days. So if someone mentioned this angle is vertical, would it be wrong? No. The mass angle will be with respect to horizontal only, which means if you give some the ang angle value with respect to this force, it wouldn't be wrong either because it would be just 10 degree more. So your answer was 71 degree. So it is uh, 10 degree more of 60. I mean, if you add 10 degree to both of these, this will be what? 68.5 and this will be what? 71.5. 71.5. You got 71 degree, which means your answer is within the range. You would get uh, mass for this value in the actual exam, but for this statement, you would not get the mark because here you are messing up the uh, actual scenario with the hypothetical figure. Sir, actual scenario uh, terms keep up correctly. The resultant produces 71 degree with the 17,000 Newton force exerted on a bus by people. No. I would not, I would never go for to write the name of the forces because this is a resultant force. So it is coming from both the forces that as mentioned in the question. So there's no necessity to mention the result component force. Let me finish. The resultant is, uh, the resultant works at 71 degree with a 70,000 Newton force downward right. About both then. The resultant is, resultant works at 71 degree with the 17,000 Newton force downward right sir north south directions will like only applicable for 2d and with the directions given north south directions are only applicable if the quotient implies those directions Achha. yes chandu wala obi acha bhi bhi mode chandu acha obi tomar question answer paiso yes sir thank you sir. clear hoise ki na yes sir cool beautiful ha chandu wala so, it is the direction to horizontal respect to the horizontal. Definitely. Horizontal respect to the horizontal is 61 degree with the horizontal. Oh, yes, sir. You can't write downward right now, but I personally really, really want and push the students to write the direction because only mentioning 61.5 degree to the horizontal could mean two things. It could be downwards, it could be also upwards. But in this case, visibly, the resultant is working downward. That's why I, I compel the students, ask the students, encourage the students to write the direction that 61.5 degrees or 61 degrees with the horizontal where? Towards the sky or towards the ground? It's important to mention. Although according to this mark scheme, you don't have to mention that. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. All right. So let's get back to our point over here. So this is the part. Discuss how to measure different time intervals using clock watch and stop clock and stop watches. So you know how to measure these things, uh, uh, how to use a stopwatch. Uh, in, for the case of the measurement of time, there are multiple things which can play a very vital role. So here I'm going to discuss multiple things about the different ways we can measure time. Stopwatches work just fine. One important thing for stopwatch is the stopwatch is a manually operated device, and we human beings has a thing called reaction time. For a standard human being, a reaction time is about 0 0.3 to 0 0.8 seconds. So on an average, we can consider it to be about 0 0.5, let's say. So for one performance, that is 0 0.5. What does it mean? From seeing a thing to reacting for that thing, our body system can be late up to 0 0.5 seconds for average people. So if you're trying to observe the motion of an object, so you will see something, start the stopwatch. That's one, 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 one motion. And then you will see at the end something else, and then you're gonna stop the stopwatch. So you are trying to operate two different happening by your bio, bio, bio. So you're operating two different things by the biomechanical systems of your body. So Acme, pull up on. Uh, I'm having a call. Sorry, did you guys know that the Q1 Q1 mission people reached to the 
uh, ISS? Uh, Manasar? What? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. SpaceX had their first alive human mission successfully completed by sending them to ISS. And then the uh, uh, capsule is supposed to return back to Earth for uh, for in a reusable manner. I'm not sure about how far they did they went. I mean, did the capsule came back to Earth or not? I did not find it out yet, but it's supposed to come back. One huge step towards us becoming multiplanetary species. Sir, repeat comment, sir. Kyulo. Sir, link the other well, 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 kids, I don't have to give you a link. You just go after the class, write SpaceX recent happening, and then follow the news or the video feeds, whatever you have. SpaceX recent. Good enough. All right. Definitely. I and mean, what's not to like about him? He's amazing. Yeah. Even his sarcasms are good. I mean, it's good. He can put really good sarcasm, like really good sarcasm. The interview with, 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 with Jack Ma was amazing. The boring company. He has a lot of stuff developed for a lot of things. And the way things are, he is, I mean, this is just my personal idea. The, the way he has involved in things in different places that all of these things would ultimately play a role whenever we will start to make infrastructure in a different planet from fresh like if you really want to make mars human inhabitable and how would you have a proper communication system so that you do not have the kind of traffic jam that we have in earth so we can plan it ahead by having prototypes building built on earth so hyperloop boring company these are all advent systems where he can check out his ideas and initially implement those things in a much better version to the other planets that we're going to go to. Do you get my point? Yes. Sir. So he's in, if you ask me, he's in all the right places for all the right reasons. So anyway, uh, the point I was trying to make that we human beings had a thing called reaction time and because of reaction time, time measurements can be errorful in a lot of cases, in a lot of cases. So <clears throat> what we do to minimize this error is that we average out. Average out means that if we are trying to measure a very, very small amount of time, other than measuring that time within that small interval, we prefer to lengthen it up. We measure a large amount of time so that our error of reaction time error will be distributed over that large amount of time. A very common example is for the time measurement for a simple pendulum. So other than taking we, our aim for the simple pendulum calculations in most cases is to measure the time period of the pendulum, which is basically the time required for one full oscillation. But in all cases, we prefer to take at uh, typically take 10 oscillations. The minimum number of oscillation that you should take is five. The maximum number of oscillation that is recommended is 20. Less than five is too small to distribute our reaction time error. More than 20 is too big in terms of time consumption. 10 is typically the standard value. So we observe, other than directly starting and stopping for one oscillation, we observe 10 continuous os oscillation. And then, and that's how we operate the stopwatch. And as a result, our entire time-based error is distributed over 10 time periods. So whenever we will divide the total time measurement by 10, our reaction time error would be distributed over 10 time periods. So which means individual time period measurement would be affected by one tenth of the reaction time error that we human beings have. That's one of the reasons that we have to go for multiple time measurements. And then if we do more measurements of tenosity, for example, let's say, if you, let's say you're trying to measure the uh, time period for one effective length of the simple pendulum, what we recommend that you take, for, to make one time measurement, you take 10 oscillations, they do that, do that again. So if you do that same time oscillation time period twice, then you are averaging more. The statistical expectation, although statistics is not applicable for a type of reading of only two readings, I mean, there is a certain minimum number of, uh, of, of subject specimen that you need to have for statistical probability to be applicable. But even so, uh, we are assuming that uh, if we take two readings, which is better than taking only one reading. So 
the whole point of repeat and average is to get closer to the actual value that we're trying to measure. That's the aim. Repeat and average does not eliminate the error. It minimizes the error. Eliminating error in most cases can prove to be really difficult. And in most cases, we don't attempt to do that. We, what we do is that we mention our results within a certain amount of acceptable limits. For example, uh, if I ask you, what is the length of the pen that you're holding in your hand? Mentioning the length of this thing could go a long way in I mean, because how up to how decimal places should you mention it? That is limited by the measurement device that you're using. If you're using a meter rule, you'll be limited up to one millimeter. If you're using a barnacle bars, maybe 0 0.05 millimeter. If you're, uh, if you're using a macular screw gauge, maybe 0 0.01 millimeter. That's your step size. You cannot ma ma quote a measurement that is smaller of that fraction. So it's very much limited to what equipment do we have. So that's another important factor. So one measure, one way of measuring the measure time is the stopwatch works. And the thing that you need to understand that in applicable cases where the measured time is supposed to be significantly long, let's say in terms of minutes, for example, heating experiments. If you go draw that, uh, if, you, if, you, if you draw a practical heat experiment uh, uh, for the graph, on the y axis we plot the temperature and on the x axis we go horizontally we plot the time. And typically the time axis is plotted in minutes. Why? Because typically heating heat experiments take a much longer time than seconds. In those cases, using a stopwatch is not necessary. You can basically take your time measurement from a wall clock. So you observe the heat, heat temperature changing. You're observing a wall clock. You see the second hand going around. Then you see one second is complete. Then you take a look at the th thermometer. Maybe you take two, three, four, five, maybe 10 seconds to take a proper reading of the thermometer. Uh, five seconds is usually standard, but you can take up to 10 seconds. And that 10 second variation would not matter much in terms of temperature reading. You're pretty much gonna have the same reading within acceptable range of accuracy. So if your measured time is significantly large, you can also avoid the use of a stopwatch, no big deal. Then there comes another scenario that there are certain scenarios or there are certain type of experiments we have to do where we are bound to measure a very small time. We don't have the opportunity or luxury to measure multiple of this time for obvious reasons. Very common example is that if you are trying to do a laboratory experiment for the time it takes for a falling object to fall to a predefined amount of height. For example, let's say if you are dropping an object from one meter, two meter, 1.5 meter, uh, different distances, how much time does it take for that object to fall through that, through that vertical distance starting from rest? Now, we cannot by all means do a continuous repetition of this observation because unlike oscillation, the, the object is not gonna fall down and magically reappear on the same position and then do the whole thing. Oscillation goes continuously, left, right, left, right, left, right. So you have one oscillation finishes, the next oscillation starts immediately. So you have a continuous time go, time, time continu continuum going on, but that's not applicable for a falling object. It falls down and it's, it's a one single falling and that's basically it. So you have to, and that, that time that it takes for an object to fall down under gravity starting from rest is not very large. So measuring that time with a human operated stopwatch is really not a good idea. It's not gonna give us a very accurate set of readings. So how can we go for to measure that? There are two types of measurement techniques that we can go by. One is what we call the light gate sensors. We can use a light gate that is attached with a computer. Uh, how does that light gate work? I'm gonna show you some images and I'll explain it to you. We can use some light gates for that measurement. And the second mechanism is that we can use a high speed camera. The idea of a high speed camera is that uh, we're gonna set up, uh, I mean, high-speed camera set up a mechanism double to see, and I want you guys to try to visualize. We're gonna hold up the object at a certain location by some mechanism, uh, clamp or hand or some electromagnet, something. We're gonna have a meter rule beside. <laughs> we're gonna place a high-speed camera. High-speed camera means it is a high shutter speed, higher frames, higher frames per second. We're gonna place a high-speed camera that will be, that will have that will cover the entire range of the fall. So if you are doing this one for one meter, it's going to have the whole one meter covered. If you're doing it for the two meter, it's going to have the whole two meter covered. And then we're going to start the high speed camera and allow the drop to happen. And the object is going to fall down. And later we'll be finding out by sliding the time bar of that video feed that exactly how much time did it take to cover that distance that we are trying to go for. Because moving that scarcer of your high speed video frame by frame is actually, can actually enable you to measure time very precisely. For example, if you have 1000 frames per second, which means between every frame, you have 
one thousandth of a second. If you have hundred frames per second, between every frame you have one hundredth of a second. That's a very precise amount of time. So we can do that. We can essentially do that. So using a high speed camera is an acceptable experimental equipment for these days because high speed cameras are not so rare in different parts of the world and it is uh, achievable and cheap enough to be incorporated as a basic laboratory equipment. So uh, you can mention the use of that in appropriate cases. The way a light gate works can be a bit interesting. Let me show you some example maybe. What is this animal? Order. 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 No orders. Sir, what's the speciality of that animal, sir? They are fluffy. They build dams on rivers, sir. That's a beaver. Asha, uh, this is actually pretty uh, one thing that there are multiple species that I'm going to name. Here's the deal. Capybara, otter, beaver, uh, ferret, squirrel. They apparently are very close to each other. Rodent family, no, sir? Meerkat. I don't think uh, uh, squirrels are a rodent family. I'm not sure. I really like ferrets. Ferrets are like really cute. They're generically small. So, yeah. Meerkats, big thing. Meerkats are a lot of people. They're 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 a lot of people. Yeah, meerkats are pretty amazing. Okay. So, this is uh okay this is actually uh, there are a, a beautiful uh the pictures or images over here for us to discuss beautiful uh ah nice nice this is how a basic light get looks like a basic light gets look like looks like so what you need to understand that in the light gate we have a hollow space in between this hollow space is the key this hollow space allows an object to pass through this place. Now, how does that help us? Let me show you. Uh, if I try to give you a bit of an example for this case, this, this example, this example, this example, they're all pretty much the same. Uh, let me just tell you what is happening here. In this scenario, this is a computer where the light gates are connected, which is in this case is given as TSA. Uh, this can give you multiple measurements. This can give uh, this, uh, this the equipment can give you a measurement for how much time. So the idea is that, I mean, if you have a look at this setup, uh, have a look at this setup, actually. Let's pick up this, this picture. Good, good picture, beautiful picture. That we're gonna release this trolley with a cardboard attached on top. As we're gonna release the trolley from rest, it's gonna slide down. And at one point, this card is gonna block the channel of light. So what happens over here? Uh, between these two parts, we have one part that illuminates the light, typically laser, that is sh shined directly onto the other side where there is a receive, re receiver. So these light rays are continuously falling and interruption of, this, interruption of these light rays can lead to a reading. How does that work? So let's say this story is going to flow by, uh, move, move by on the down the slope. And Currently, this light gate is having uninterrupted light, so it's not reading anything. The moment the card will enter into the path of the light gate, this light rate signal will be interrupted. That's when this light gate one will start counting time. This trolley is gonna pass by, and when the when the last end goes through the trolley and comes out, that light connection is re-established because now the blocker has moved away. Then the time count of the light gate one would stop. By this mechanism, we will have a measure that how much time, for how much time that light signal was blocked. Or to be more precise, in other words, I can say, how long did it take for this card to travel to this point on the track? So we know the distance, we can measure the length of this card, we can get the time over here, 
if you do the distance uh, with speed equals to distance over time, you can measure the instantaneous speed, instantaneous speed of this trolley at this location. You can measure that. That's one thing to measure. A part two, bujha kaise kena? Oh, okay, sir. Sir, this, uh, so it means that the switch is a beam of light. The switch there. is yeah, precisely. The switch is a beam of light. Interruption starts the switch. Re-establishment stops the switch. A part ta ki bujha kaise shobar? Jekhane ki bol lam? Manasar, will this trolley yes, be sir. that fast that we won't be able to see it and need a light to get? Bujhe ne aao bolo. Mane, we need we use light gates for things that's super fast. So can these trolleys go that fast? Well, it doesn't essentially have to be fast. Uh, it can be pretty slow, but if you uh, light gates can actually give us really precise measurement for cases oh. where repetition or continuous repetition like a simple pendulum is not achievable. Okay, sir. So it also act it also act a measurement. Same jini shamla ekhano measure korte pari. Same jini shamla ekhano measure korte pari. So if you measure both of these things, you can basically can get uh, initial velocity over here, a final velocity over here. You can physically measure the distance in between them. Then you can go for v square equals to v square plus twice s to find out the uh, acceleration between these two points. You can measure a lot of different different things. That's one way to go for. The other thing the, the, this is just one way to measure. So we can measure instantaneous velocity by individual light gates. And there's another thing that we can also measure that how much time does it take for this trolley to travel from light gate one to light gate two. That is that can be also measured as well. So this device can also give you a measurement that when this light gate was interrupted, starting from that time to when this light gate will be interrupted. So the comparison between start to start. So when this card enters the light gate one and then it comes out and then it will enter the light gate two. It can also give you a measurement of time that how much time does the story take to travel from light gate one to light gate two. That, that measurement can be also available from this device, computerized device. So it can give you two set of data. It can give you a measurement of time for how much duration the light was blocked at a single light gate position. It can also give you the difference of time between multiple light gates as well. You can also set up maybe a, a couple of more light gates if you need it, need that many for some experiment and you can get that data as well. So this is essentially how this whole thing is working. So we have a, we have a what is this called? Uh, air track over here with a, we once again have a cardboard. Measurement of this cardboard is very, has to be pretty precise and it is possible for us to measure uh, lengths precisely because we have vernier calipers, screw gauges. So measuring the length precisely is not that much of a big deal, but measuring the time precisely for us human beings is happens to be a big deal because of the reaction time that uh, built-in problem that we have in our in our, in our biomechanical systems. So here you can see uh, another, uh, the vertical experiment setup. So uh, I'm trying to find out a falling object light gate setup. Uh, am I gonna find it? It's not so visible. Uh, is this? Yeah, exactly. Free fall apparatus, beautiful. This is this is the this is the image that I'm talking about. Okay, so they're selling they're selling this device. So the way this thing is working is that yeah, the, these these things are Bluetooth connected, which makes it even easier. So you don't have a wired connection. Uh, beautiful, beautifully designed. So we 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 might as well have uh, 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 an object that is attached over here. Where typically, we can choose a uh, iron 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 sphere or iron object which can be attached by a solenoid over here, and then we can uh, stop the solenoid becoming a solenoid. So it will lose the magnetism. It will drop the object. So over here we have a built-in ruler, so you can measure the distance between the two light gates, and then as you draw as the object will move. This will interrupt the light signal over here. Then it will interrupt the light signal over here as well. So you can measure precisely how much is the time does this object take to travel from here to here. So measurement of this distance with your uh, with respect to the time between the time gaps of these two light gates can lead up to a lot of precise calculation. Come on, Buchu, you see. Light gate operation of Bujaga signal. The paper for a juno quite important. Paper for a chapter for a base question. Ahoy. Any questions so far? No, sir. Uh, 
আচ্ছা এটা গেল হচ্ছে টাইম মেজারমেন্ট ইয়েস সো লাইট গিয়ার কি হবে স্পিড মেজার করে স্যার ওটা ক্যালকুলেশন কেমন জানতে হবে ইউ ডোন্ট হ্যাভ টু প্রেসিসলি নো দ্য ক্যালকুলেশন বাট সামটাইমস দে মাইট আস্ক ইউ দ্যাট হাউ ডাজ দ্য লাইট গেট পারফর্মস ইজ জব অর ফর এ পেপার ফর কোশ্চেন or maybe they would give you some data and you have to logically understand that what to be divided by what thing to get the speed at a certain point for example let's say uh, in the paper 4 they give you some experimental setup that looks like this the first experiment that we have uh, let's say that looks like this 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 one and then they give you uh, two three set of time that let's get one records the time of uh, of blocking of this much like a two liter sign at a time and the time between ligate 1 and ligate 2 is this much let's say they give you this all of this three individual time frame and the length of the trolley so if you don't know what to be divided by which quantity you would know how to operate that thing so it's unlikely that you would have to uh, explain this in words but it's important that you understand how the machine does its job in terms of calculation if that makes sense So we find out the initial I mean, instantaneous velocity by dividing the length of the object with the time. I mean, it blocks yes. the light. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Taki, yes, sir. Do you have question? Answer, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, sir. Our laboratory is taking our mother. Like, um, lighting at us. Thaka uchit. Schools which can afford and teach CE syllabus. should have lag gates i don't own them for my lab i tried to buy them but they, they, i could not source them properly from reliable sources i mean uh, there are vendors which are available in dhaka city which are, who are willing to sell you lag gates with zero warranty okay sir so that's why i could not achieve them but uh, as per ca syllabus uh, schools institutions who can afford these devices should have these devices in the laboratory to demonstrate these things to the kids well then again uh, we can always skip to physically achieve them and have a projector connect with a youtube connection and show the kids the videos of other people doing this experiment and make sense as well that's an easy alternative that can work sir cro thakle to eta thaka uchit sir cro cro's are reliable devices but mane I don't know why, but I could not achieve one. There are very few vendors who bring light gates because most schools don't use light gates, and we don't have. We, we are not till date that much of a research oriented nation. The light gates would be required in a lot of places, so the market is pretty niche, and the the few people who sell it don't sell it with warranty. They just go by that. You can check it in our uh, shop as long as you want, but the moment you take the device out of our uh, out of our shop and we don't know you anymore that's the way it is kisu <laughs> busla anyway like so then we have this thing we need some symbols recognize the use of sensor system of your teacher will have more information so what info your teacher will have that you are not supposed to uh, memorize the actual unit definitions although they are pretty interesting and verity sam is in your channel they this guy uh makes a lot of amazing uh videos about the unit systems and everything especially about the mass he's uh obsessed about the kilogram and pound and silicon ball and uh and grave and graph and stuff beautiful series you should see it if you have time which i believe you, you have very very less of anyway and then the other thing that is important that you have to know the uh 10th multiplier table that uh mega means how much uh 10 to the power what Uh, giga means what milli means what uh, micro pico nano this means what so the 10 to the power power of these values are to be known to you this is one important thing and then also you have to know that there are seven fundamental quantities knowing the name of the seven fundamental quantities is good enough uh, if you can remember their units that's even better uh, the seven fundamental quantities that we have is so fundamental quantities mean uh, so they are not called fundamental quantities they are called base quantities that's the key term that the sandish chose so i shouldn't change it the base quantity there are seven base quantities uh these are length mass time temperature current luminous density and amount of substance and the units go by that length is meter mass is kilogram time second temperature kelvin uh current is ampere luminous density go for candela and amount of substance is given in moles now among all of this uh, among all of these measurements uh the, 
there is only one uh, defined as natural constant, which is basically uh, the mole number. Uh, so Avogadro's constant is defined to be a natural constant, and also uh, Planck's constant is a natural constant. Universal gravitational constant is a natural constant. There are some constants which are natural constants, means that it, they have universally same value everywhere. Uh, nature defined their values and we cannot change it uh, by our wish. This is pretty interesting stuff. So if you get into the world of uh, unison measurements, I mean, this is, unison measurements is actually a huge part of physical science researchers. I mean, this is important stuff. Although it might sound pretty uh, boring, but it is really important stuff. Whatever you measure is not valid or useful unless your measurements are standardized and accessible and repeatable by other people. Then comes theme two, Newton mechanics, kinematics, speed velocity acceleration. Space state what is meant by speed, state what is meant by velocity, calculate the average speed using the formula, state what is meant by uniform acceleration, calculate the acceleration using the formula, acceleration velocity divided by time taken, state what is meant by non-uniform acceleration. Bolo, a school I'll take requests from you because discussing all of them one by one is just a waste of time in my opinion if you ask me. I could tell you, but it's not essentially required because you do know what is speed, you know what is velocity. So which bullet do you want me to discuss? You can always say all of them. That is an allowed answer. And Kunta? Gravgula. Gravgula? Yes, sir. Yes. Graph taken a graph up Don't worry, graph up discussion pretty simple. Graph discussion is interesting. I love discussing the graphs. Acha, by the way, I recently came across a very nice quote that I would like to share with your kids. I'm not sure if you kids qualify for this, but you might as well. Uh, no, not this one. Yeah, this one. Read. It doesn't did not necessarily came from Buddha. Buddha's picture is here to maybe symbolize peace slash happiness. These are very true words. Read this. Yes. Achha, this was given by Ralph Mars Long. Okay. Important stuffs. So, okay. What happens in the graphs? Sir. Yes. So, what did I say? Up in room and mode, sir. Wall and mode, the actor court she lost her. What did I say? Nice flow. Maturity is when you have the capability and information to destroy someone who did you wrong, but you just breathe, walk away and let life deal with them. Yes, it is. I had a P for a bundle or P channel channel. Yes, but in inverted format. Yes, sir. Yes. And the font was specially chosen to be it difficult to be difficult to read. But if you just hold it out uh, inside out and hold it against the light source, you'll be able to read it pretty fast for those who know how to do this. Or you could alternately take a picture in your uh, smartphone and do the flip option because every smartphone have those things in the image uh, management stuff. Anyway. <clears throat> 
বুড়া হয়ে যাচ্ছে বুঝছো ওই জন্য এইসব কোট এখন খুব মিনিংফুল মনে হয় because i can relate like yes <laughs> so this is what is happening so we have a graph graphs are two dimensional representation of data we have vertical axis we have horizontal axis anytime any graph is represented as something versus something the first variable is always the y axis variable the second variable is always the x axis variable graphs can have three set of properties the first property is value of y with respect to x and vice versa for example if you have a graph straight line curve uh, worm spiral whatever graphs are not supposed to look like this but whatever if they look like this for whatever reason in mathematical equations can give you graphs like this graphs give us corresponding coordinates so for one value of x you can have another value of y you can have multiple values of x for for example if you consider for this y value for the loop you can see that there are one two three four five six x values for this y value so you can have multiple values for one y value for x value or vice versa so the first set of information that you get from, from a graph is for one set of value of one code one axis you get the relevant value for the other axis that's the first set the second information that you get is the gradient or it's called slope which is basically delta y by delta x this is meant as rate of change of y with respect to Sir, x rate why when it's when the x axis is time now Yes, <clears throat> yes, you say, you're absolutely correct. I should not use the term rate over here. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Other than, I mean, I'm choosing, I'm deliberately choosing not to use the term rate. I, I, I was carried away because in most cases we would deal with uh, time graphs, speed time graph, velocity time graph, acceleration time graph. So that's why the rate comes in. So it was an inherent mistake, my bad. So delta by delta essentially means change of y with respect to change of x. So how does y change as x changes that's the basic meaning for gradient but whenever typically we describe the gradient of a graph we always describe it uh, how does y change as x increases so we always describe the change of the gradient of a graph from left to right with increasing value of x never from the opposite direction so this is a built-in uh, default. So if I say that the gradient of a graph is increasing, it means as we're observing the value change from left to right, the graph is becoming steeper. I, but I would not say that as we are observing from left to right or as we are observing from X increase, that will be inherently implied. So that's the idea for a gradient, which can be interpreted for a lot of different quantities, depending upon what quantities do we have on this X and this X. And one more thing is pretty important is that because the gradient is handles with the division of these two quantities, y quantity you have x quantity. So if you have a definable quantity that comes from the ratio of these two terms, y by x, the gradient will in most cases represent that quantity. I'm using the term in most cases because there can be exceptions as well. In most cases that will represent that quantity. For example, velocity is given by distance over time. So dt graph gradient is speed or velocity. Acceleration is given by change of velocity over change of time. So gain of acceleration uh, vt graph is acceleration so this works just fine no big deal but one of the exception that if you recall you should be able to recall but i'm not going to get into detail for that but for those who can recall you should be able to recall that gradient of voltage versus current graph is resistance but sorry gradient of voltage versus current graph is not resistance r equals to v by i r is not equals to del v by del i this is one of the exceptions that i was talking about yeah, no, sir. because by definition is the at voltage well voltage by current total voltage you by total current not the change of voltage by change of current by definition resistance is defined by that sir del v by del i to change in resistance of an 
not necessarily yeah. not necessarily for a curve behavior it cannot be upper movement not necessarily for example if you plot a graph or, 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 or a certain uh, elliptical object and let's say if you have a curve like that if you want to measure the gradient of this curve at this point so the gradient of this point of this graph let's say gradient is given by m is del v by del i that is a quantity but would you say that one represents the rate of change of that is that represents delta r because delta r would mean the difference of resistance for two different points but here we are only handling with one different one point so delta r would mean difference of two resistance values enough so del v by del i doesn't necessarily mean the change of resistance doesn't necessarily upper movement delta r would mean the difference of two resistance values that's r2 minus r1 yes, but whenever we are measuring the gradient of a certain curve of voltage versus current graph for example let's see if you measure it right over here this gradient should show oh uh, well ek minute daro amar monitor er adapter er pet kharap hoyse randomly amar monitor flicker kore sorry so ekta amra dekhte parbo ki flicker theke amra ter por kotha sir ग्रेडियंट If you want to measure the resistance of this of this component for which this graph was obtained, you have to get the exact voltage out of the y-axis intercept. You have to get the exact current from the x-axis intercept and get the ratio of these two things to get the resistance of this thing at this point. Yes, sir. Which is V by I, not del V by del I. Del V by del I can give you some quantity, which can be defined as the gradient of the graph. But that quantity, the gradient of the graph, would not be resistance. That's the point that I'm trying to make. Oh, so V by I ita di be resistance, but del V by del I would give anything other than resistance. Yes. So del R ki di. Can we find out the gradient for two different points of the curve? I'm not entirely sure of what what, what is the answer for this question. I haven't. I have not gone through that research. I I cannot tell you for sure, but I can look it up. Okay, sir. I don't. I don't know this honestly, but it will not be resistance. That I know for sure. Yes, sir. Okay. So that's the idea for the resistance. So if we have two quantities over here which are defined by some uh, physical variable, that the ratio of these two quantities gives you some defined physical quantity, then the gradient can also represent that. For example, if you have a graph of force versus area, then the gradient of this quantity would be pressure. If you have a graph of mass versus volume, then the gradient of this quantity gradient can be density, so on and so forth. You can think of a lot of quantities which come from the ratio of two different values. For example, if you get a graph of work done versus displacement, let's say x, then the ratio of these two things might give you the force because uh, w goes to what f by x. So if I x I bring the x down, w by x give you f. So, if you plot a graph of work done over distance, that gradient might as well give you the force involved for that question. So, there can be a lot of examples, which is impossible to cover for any finite a discussion. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make that if that if there exists a defined quantity that comes from the ratio of these two things, that can lead for that gradient to be that quantity. So that's the second property that we, that any graph can give us. The third property that we can get from any graph is what we call the area. Area is basically the product of these two quantities with some mathematical values because of the shape. For example, if you have triangle, you have half into base into height. If you have a rectangle, you have only base into height. If you have a parallelogram, you have base into height. So 
depending upon the shape that you are handling you can have some numerical constants which is not affecting your quantity it is just affecting your number but whenever we're calculating area uh, we are basically multiplying some value of delta y with some value of i should not write across it looks like x some value of delta y with some value of delta x so which means we are basically multiplying these two quantities which means that if the two quantities on the y axis and the x axis are such that their product could give us a meaningful quantity then the area of that graph can mean that quantity what do i mean by this pretty simple is that uh, area for example if we have a velocity versus time graph so if we have a velocity versus time graph so if you put the velocity into time that basically gives you distance average distance to be honest uh, uh, so so the area and the vd graph can be a distance now important factor is that you have to consider the scalar and vector terms pretty 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 importantly area under the speed time graph is a distance area under the velocity time graph is displacement i'll say it again area under the speed time graph is distance area under the velocity time graph is displacement area under the force into displacement graph can be work done now work done can also be in terms uh, in other terms can be said to be energy for example if you push an object over a certain distance the work that you'll be doing on this object considering there is no re resistive forces uh, the entire work that will be doing on the object will be, will be stored in the object as kinetic energy considering is is gaining speed so you might as well say that uh, area and the force versus distance graph can be energy as well if it's a horizontal track and then again if you if lift up an object vertically uh, if you have an area versus area under the force versus vertical height or weight of an object versus vertical height if you plot a graph like that that for that, that that area might be the gp gain so it's important that you understand the concept that if the product of those two quantities give us something that is meaningful if the product of those two quantities give us something that is meaningful in terms of defined physical quantities that area can be that quantity similarly like gradient is the ratio and area is the product it is a graph here. first stuff that we need to understand that this is the three set of information that you can get from the graph more importantly for your syllabus we discuss about what kind of different gradients can we have for a certain graph what are the different type of gradients can we have from a certain type of graph so we can have primarily two type of graphs we, have, we define them to be increasing graphs or decreasing graphs so increasing graphs are those things where as x value increases y value increases these are increasing graphs alternately if there are graphs where as x value increases because graphs are always described as x value increases so this will not be changed if y value decreases they are called decreasing graphs so that's just it so bottom line it means that gradient of increasing graphs will be always positive because as x increases y also increases so if you think for delta y by delta x you would always have positive numbers on both of the sides new matter new matter both will be positive so you have a ratio that is positive so the gradient of this graph increasing graphs will be a positive gradient and vice versa for decreasing graphs you will have negative gradient because when x is increasing y is decreasing which means on the numerator you will have a small minus peak which is a negative number so if you do the ratio you will kind of end up with a negative number before getting to the idea of negative number sorry Denominator negative number hote pare. Ah, denominator negative number positive hobe. Yes, sir. Sir, denominator negative mana to ita mane sir left e jatsen, na sir. Ah, yes. Mathematically, it is all it is doable by the equation of y two minus x one divided by x two minus x one for any choice of points. But for physical description, we always go for x increasing. Okay, okay. So, before I get into this discussion in detail, I'd like to take you in another part. Like, that is, if you basically consider the coordinate system for any uh, Cartesian coordinate system, y axis, x axis, if you plot some lines, you should primarily have a really good understanding for how. For how is the gradient of a line is affected for example horizontal lines have zero gradient vertical lines have undefined slash infinite gradient 
lines which are like this. They have positive gradient. Lines which are like this. Anywhere on the coordinate, or not only on the first quadrant, second, third, fourth, they can be anywhere. They can be go across the whole thing, negative gradient line. Uh, you can have a whole positive gradient line only on the negative axis. This is a positive gradient line because the line is upward right. So any lines which are uh, somewhat like this, they are all positive gradient lines. Any line which is somewhat like this, they are all negative gradient lines. Flat lines, zero gradient. Vertical lines, infinite gradient. These are the four basic shapes that you have to be able to recognize. So upward right, positive gradient, downward right or upward left, negative gradient, vertical line, indefinite gradient or undefined gradient, infinite gradient, horizontal line, zero gradient. So these are for straight lines. The consideration for straight lines can help us to understand better the uh, discussion for the curves because whenever we go for the discussion for curves the curves essentially have different gradients at different location on the curve so to be able to determine or to express the gradient of a curve we have to consider precisely the gradient of the tangents of individual location on the curve let me show you what I mean by this statement. Let me show you by some drawing what I mean by this statement. For example, let's say if we have a coordinate system, so y versus x, and we have a curve that looks like this. You cannot say the gradient of this curve is this thing and make a full stop and make a definitive statement like that. You cannot. Because along this different part of this whole curve, we have different gradients. So you're gonna have one gradient over. So if you are trying to measure the gradient over here, what do you have to do? You have to draw a tangent on this curve at this location. Let me draw this tangent with maybe red for us to be able to understand it. So let's say this is that may this may be the tangent of this graph. I might as well. What happened? What did I do? What did I just do? That's a bit weird. So, hand movement is not going to So, if we draw a tangent at the designated point, let's say this was the designated point, then we can get the uh, then the gradient of this tangent of that is tangent with the curve at this point is the gradient of the curve at this point. So, this the gradient of the straight line helps us to measure the gradient because we can now go ahead and draw a triangle draw the vertical line draw the horizontal line go for del y by del x calculation from the gradient and that again that can get you the gradient of this part so the gradient of the curve at this location is that value if you want to consider for any other location it will be different for example if you want to go for to measure the gradient of this point you just have to repeat the whole process so you have to draw another tangent over here let's say the tangent can be somewhat like this <clears throat> uh, all right uh, is this tangent all right or should this be lifted up on any or, uh, or pushed down on any of the sides kids have a look and tell me for those who remember how to judge a proper grade proper tangent is this tangent all right right yes yeah. so equal touching with the to write it. Right. This is a better acceptable line, Tena. Yes, I think so. So for those of you who are not getting for those of you who are not getting what this was about, this is about choosing a good position of the orientation of the uh, base fit tangent for a certain point. The idea is that uh, 
whenever you will be physically drawing a tangent on a straight line let's say in this case our aimed point where we are trying to draw the tangent was here this was our aim point give me a line over here and the idea is that if you look deeply onto the line the common section between the line straight line and the curve should be preferably equal on both sides so if i if you have a look over here that this is the part where you can see some white pixel starting so which means this part is the left side common length and this is the part where the right side has uh, white pixels are so this is the part where the right side common location is located so you need to make sure that these two lengths are visibly equal acceptably equal if they are widely different then we are going to run into some trouble for example let's say uh, i'm going to show you what do i mean by that on this very exact example but just i'm going to keep and steal a part of this and set it up over here for future reference and then i'm going to do control z control y control c x control z z z z z z z z z z z Okay. The reason I blanked out this graph because I want to show you what would the wrong line look like. So if I try to draw a, a line that is not a proper tangent, but it would appear to be a proper tangent. Can I make it thinner? I should don't want to make it thinner. Let's make it realistic and keep this thickness. So let's say this is this was my aimed point. This was my aim point. So take a good look at this location. This is the blue dot over here. So I'm trying to draw the tangent over here. So if I draw this tangent and you have a look, my aimed point is right over here. I'm keeping my cursor over here. Now you, you judge. Do you see acceptable equal overlap on both sides? Everyone. No. Yes. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Left overlap, basically, yes, right, 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 right overlap. So, left side overlap to come either left take two right take two So, this is a judgment. Now, if you, uh, so this is a very precise type of judgment, uh, so that you can actually choose a proper orientation and location of the tangent line. Because in many questions, uh, you can ask a very simple question that 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 you can ask measure the gradient of the curve at that point by drawing the tangent and further calculation there is always a range of acceptable answers that the tangent value should be ranged from this to this so the examiners are pretty lenient about this range but unless you know what is your preferred criteria should be to choose a proper alignment of the tangent if you do not know this it's very easy to fall out of that range but as long as you know that what am i trying to look at what i'm trying to achieve if you know this definitively then it's almost always possible to get hit the exact mid mid midpoint value the or the exact perfect value so it's important that you know what you are trying to achieve so you can also do that so the so coming back to the whole idea that this is uh, that if we have a situation like this and well because i just uh, drew you this line over here i'm going to make this choice of the point different i said now I, I was less as in i was trying to draw the curve over here so that now we have equal overlap just uh, redefining the point because i decide to be lazy so uh, in this case we have a different gradient because this is a different orientation what you simply need to observe whenever you're trying to describe a curve and either you draw them or you try to visualize them that if you if i start to visualize multiple different tangent orientation from left to right how are these lines stacking up are they becoming more flattened flatter or are they becoming more vertical in this case they are becoming more flatter so this is more steep this is less steep and if i draw on the right this will be less or less or steeper this is showing us that this is a type of a graph where the gradient is decreasing so this is an increasing graph because y value is increasing which means positive gradient but that value of the positive gradient will be large on the left side for small value of x as you go for higher value of x that value of gradient would be slowly becoming less so that way we define this graph is this is an increasing graph with decreasing gradient in vice versa if this was a velocity time graph we could have said that the object is accelerating with decreasing acceleration the object is accelerating so it means it is speeding up every second each next second 
it has a higher speed than the earlier second. But the amount of speed gain per second is becoming less over every second. So initially it was speeding up pretty fast. As this time is going by, it's speeding up less fast. So the amount of gain of speed when it was at lower speed was high. The amount of gain of speed when it was faster was slow for the same duration of time. So that's the idea for the gradient calculations. Based upon this discussion, uh, we can have basically six different shapes, primary shapes. We can have composite shapes by, um, by combining multiples of them. That's just a very basic thing. But if you simply consider the shapes that we can have, increasing graphs can have these three different shapes and decreasing graphs can have these, these six different, these three different shapes. And they can all have the individual distributions. For example, this one is a increasing graph with constant gradient, increasing graph with decreasing gradient, increasing graph with increasing gradient. Decreasing graph with constant gradient, decreasing graph with increasing gradient, because this line is becoming steeper. So initially we'll have a slanted line, then the lines will gonna be more vertical as we go to the right. And then the number six, decreasing graph with decreasing gradient. So this is a six different fundamental shape that we can have to handle. Sometimes we can also have to deal with a composite number. For example, if we have, if, if for example, if we have, uh, let's say a, ski, uh, a, 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 a skiing person who is skiing the downhill, uh, has a velocity time graph that looks like this. Let's say it looks like this. So it can have a lot of different shapes. So, uh, so yeah. So it can have a lot of different shapes. For example, all the places where you can see the, so for example, from here to here, this is a speed increase. So this is the part where he was accelerating, but you can see that the gradient is decreased. So he's, he's accelerating at that decreasing acceleration. Then from here to, let's say, all the way up to here, he is decelerating with increasing deceleration. Here, you can see the line is becoming steeper. And then from here to here, uh, decreasing deceleration. Then here, it is increasing acceleration. And suddenly from over here, he had a uh, sudden change of acceleration, not sudden change of velocity. Velocity is continuous. So he was accelerating pretty steeply, but suddenly over here, that acceleration becomes stopped. So maybe he made a hard break or he suddenly slided. So he actually decided to change the acceleration somehow. And then for this part, he is losing velocity pretty much uniformly. Let's say this is a straight line. I can say that uh, he is now uh, decelerating at a constant value. So you can have all of these individual shapes uh, in uh, for a composite graph, you can break it up into equal part, uh, not non-equal, or uh, you can break it up into convenient parts, each of which should represent any of these shapes for you to easily describe that part, which becomes far too important whenever we consider the graph for the parachutist. So the, for the parachutist graph, uh, we have a shape which somewhat looks like this. Did you kids see the jump of the person who they took a uh, 30,000 feet jump, 30,000 or 20,000 feet, I forgot, with jump without the parachute? Yes, sir, it's the red bullet. Yes. No, no. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. For those of you who did not see this, you're missing out big time. You should look it up. This was unbelievable. Such a, such a space ticket jump course, you record. Space take a jump called a chill hoche. Space take a jump called a chill highest jump a human being has made. There would be a part chill. I'm talking about this. Yes, sir. And just sound a sound barrier bang silo while falling. It am exactly. But I know that this happened. I, I saw the video pretty uh, earlier. I didn't find it much interesting, but what I found very interesting. was that the person survived definitely otherwise would, would there be would that be a news no i'm talking about this one he this person did it i think he did it later this was five years ago
This is only one year error. No, this is also. Sir, what is the second video shows us? What is this? I mean. Anyway, I'm not going oh, to oh, oh, the video. I want you guys to find it out on your own. So this is the person. Look, uh, look, I can see. So what he did, he took a really high jump without the help of any parachute. He did a lot of practice. I mean, he had, he's a third generation skydiver. That's one thing that I'm uh, spoiling, uh, giving you a spoiler. So he's amazing at what he does. He can maneuver his body and orientation really precisely. And then there was a pretty large net, but not so large in terms of uh, precision he actually precisely controlled his fall to fall to a very large distance without any parachute in his back. You can see there is no parachute over here in this image. And that is the net that you can see over here. You can see there is, there is a circle. Right over here, there is a circle. I cannot take the mouse over here. It starts the chief. So that circle is basically the landing zone. At the center of the circle, you should be seeing a rectangular thing. That's basically this net. So he did that. Some other people did this with, with this thing also for yourself. So he's the first person who ever had the courage and the confidence to start this thing. And then this is the jump that you guys are saying that Red Bull jump. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. From, yes, sir. from, this, from the space shuttle with the helium balloon, he jumped. Yeah. Crazy stuff. So what is how it happens to the parachutes? I mean, you can divide up this graph of the parachutes in multiple convenient sections. For example, the initial part, which uh, where we'll have a, almost a straight line, but not never a perfect straight line. We can say that the acceleration is constant for the parachutes for this duration, which is equal to 10 meter per second square, where the air resistance is considered negligible. That's why we have a straight line graph. Beyond, the, beyond this point, let's say the graph starts to visibly start to take a curve. So it means the person is still accelerating because the velocity is going up but the gradient is becoming decreased. So the person is accelerating at a decreasing rate. So his acceleration is slowly becoming less. We a certain point the graph becomes horizontal. So this is the point where the graph becomes horizontal. This is my hand drawing because I, I meant this to be a straight line. So this is the point where the acceleration stops and the graph becomes horizontal, which means this is our first terminal velocity with the parachutes not opened yet. So it's falling at a really high speed through the atmosphere and currently the air resistance is balancing his weight. This is the point where he opens up his parachute and suddenly there's a large increase in the surface area. So the area is a very large value. The weight remains the same. So now we have a really strong upward resultant force for a downward falling person. So the person starts to decelerate very rapidly. This is a very large deceleration. This, the, the value of the deceleration has to be controlled very precisely. We cannot allow the person to have that kind of deceleration that, will, that might as well tear off his parachute or it would, uh, uh, it would uh, tear off his uh, body's bone structures or something like that. The value of this distillation, the steepness of this card has to be controlled properly as well. This is one of the reasons that the parachutes simply just don't pop off. They are folded in a way that the person, the parachute slowly, gradually uh, folds out. So that duration of time is basically what works like, a, works like a, a airbag for a car accident. It gives the person enough time to react to that deceleration change over a significant duration of period. So that's pretty important. So the person, uh, deceler uh, here the person decelerates and initially the graph has a really steep gradient. If you have a look over here, this is the important part where the most students make the mess. At the beginning of this thing here, we have a really st steep gradient over here, negative acceleration if I try to draw it right at the incident of the opening the parachute, we have a pretty steep gradient. And as you slowly go down in this line, that gradient is slowly becoming less and less and less. So if you consider right up over here, you have a decreasing gradient, which means he decelerates most immensely at the opening of the parachute, then the deceleration reduces. So he, in this segment, in this segment from, let's say from here uh, to, uh, let me just look, from here through the, through here, let's say, here, the person decelerates at a decreasing rate. Decelerates at a decreasing rate. So this is the part of the curve that is similar to number six, decelerates at a decreasing rate. So, and then right over here, the, the graph becomes horizontal again. So this is the, uh, this is right here, which has terminal velocity, same terminal velocity, the parachute is open, which has a much smaller terminal velocity in terms of value 
compared to what you had over here and which is safe for the person to land and this is the part where the person lands on the ground where there is a vertical drop which means the person just land on the ground not falling anymore so being able to describe different parts of this graph appropriately in terms of gradient change and that uh, leading up to the change of the acceleration and in some other questions which this whole description of the parachutism graph can lead up to the uh, ch change of energy as well that what kind of energy change happens in different parts that is also a very interesting thing uh, these are the questions that we'll have to handle and they will, they will pop up in the exam in the video if you, if you can actually make time i would humbly request you that if you can make time do look up for the parachutist graph for the say class 9 lecture series i know uh, you are busy but there is one thing that goes without saying that our life is practically a set of choices. No one is busy for uh, no one is busy for someone. We all have our preferences. That's it. So that's just a smart way to say that. Uh huh. But it, yeah. if you can make time, please try to do so. Uh, have a look at these two uh, videos: the parachutes and the parachutes continuum. I've gone. I mean, high over my head to describe in detail or what these things actually are happening in terms of energy conversion as well, all the stuffs might be helpful for you in the long run. I'd like to uh, stop today's class right here and pick up more from here and I have to start putting out stuffs right now. So we'll, we'll pick up more stuffs from dynamic headings in the next class because I believe I already discussed this, all of this bullet heading. So we can start picking up from Johnson Law next class. Is that all right? Yes, sir. Bye, sir. Okay. Thank you, kids. Thank you. Uh, have a nice one. Look up for stuffs. We are stuffs on YouTube. Okay, sir. Actually, we can get a show. We need. Actually, we can get a lecture. 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 We Electronics said just zero six two five. Je, uh, uh, a PDF to make a online soft core. I said, I'm PDF for masking. Glad it's a barba. Thermal. Both is it all? Thermal. Thermal and North came already. Got a who said, Thermal and North and Pindan is sure, but what should you pin cross that? Like the same. number to reach and then if I can finish all the stuff, then I'll go for uh, 15 more because uh, I, we have distributed, I think, 42 booklets for paper four, which I think that these are the uh, maximum number of people that are continuing with us. Then participant list never uh, reach up to 42 uh, I have, or 43. It should be 43. I, have, I haven't seen since the last long break. I don't blame the kids. They, everyone have their preferences. So, yeah, no big deal. Sir, I'm very electricity worksheet. I'm going to submit to us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So uh, you'll just, uh, you can receive them. They are uh, available to, to pick up. Sir, how many people are But preferably lunch or uh, let's say 2 p.m. onwards. Okay, sir. Okay. Sir, Newtonian mechanics and not stuff to talk about. Yes, Newtonian mechanics and not stuff to talk I'll print out, I think, 20 copies of Newton Magnus notes. Should I print out more than 20 copies? I mean, how many of you would like to have Newton copies of Newton Magnus notes? All of you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Oh. So, Newtonian mechanics in notes, Tom, the PhD notes. Yes, you have had, but many of you are... Okay, I'll be printing this out. I, do, I did not print it. I'll be printing this out once I finish everything else in my preference list. So, if you don't pick it up, the Newton Magnus note in the next class, don't blame me. To be honest, uh, if you want to pick everything in a single go, uh, it might as well be a good idea not to send someone tomorrow. Exactly. You can send someone, let's say, the day after tomorrow. Uh, I hope everything to be available by then, maybe. What's better? 
if you if you ask me and we can go jaja language मैं Are uh, notes such as notes. If you need both of them, you write both of them. If you don't only one, you write only one. That's it. Butcho. Yes. Plum by. Sir, I'm not going to do it. Sir, I'll get it. I really don't show up because it feels like burden to meet. Yeah, but it's been a long time, sir. It will wait for now, uncle. Nice to meet you. Sir, atomic physics or waves or worksheet set or notes thug be. Yeah, idhar thug be for sure. Idhar main pin kore bolsa bolte. Aur idhar acha kinematics se ye Newtonian mechanics se gula thug be. Newtonian mechanics se worksheet to tum aage pay so notes gula alda kore pin kora hai ne. Maine to apparently interested to pick it up. So I'll pin them out after I am done printing the uh, electromagnetism and thermal. मैंने मैंने डिज़ाइन बंडल एंड थमल बंडल। ओके सर। देखा अल्लाह बस। अल्लाह फ़िसर।